Uh, welcome everybody to the R4DS uh, package club uh, today, or not package club, project club. Um, today, Gus is going to show us his Cypher package and uh, solicit some help from us. Yes. So take it away, Gus. Cool. So this is Cypher. Um, I don't know how into history you are, but this is supposed to be like a wreath eliciting ideas of Romans and the classic Caesar Cypher. So what is Cypher and why? Um, it's a package for simple text ciphers. And that's when you take text, you perform some transformation on it to try and hide its original meaning. And I made this because I needed a flexible Caesar Cypher for advent of code. And there was, I think, one package that did Caesar ciphers and it was very restrictive on the dictionary you had to use for encoding. And if you want to install it, it's on CRAN, and you can use install packages for Cypher. And I'm hoping today that you learn some cool new text ciphers perfect for passing notes in class. Uh, there are simple text ciphers. There are several websites where you paste text into them, and they will figure out not only what cipher you used, but they'll also decode it. So these are not safe for anything ever, but they're still fun. Um, so hopefully some base R methods for dealing with text and writing speedy code with apply statements. So I'm hoping to get feedback on error handling. And if we have time, hopefully some testing, user experience and how best to work with vector inputs, what kinds of code comments people expect in open source, and then any spots where I can swap and apply for vectorization. I went through a few times, and because of how everything works, it's actually kind of difficult to do pure vectorization. So to start off, the very first function I wrote for it was a Caesar cipher. And this can be used to encrypt or decrypt. And the function does not differentiate between the two. So that's just, we'll get into how the function works. but. If you pass it encrypted text, it will give you decrypted text, and you don't have to specifically tell it you want to decrypt. Um, and what sets my version apart is you can choose your dictionary to shift by. And here's a neat little graphic from Wikipedia that just shows what's going on. Or if you were to shift by three, your A's would become X's, your B's are Y's, C's are Z's, and so on. And so it takes a lot of parameters Ah, dang it. A lot of parameters. Um, primary one is x, which is a vector that you're going to shift. n is how many places you want to shift by. So in the example before, that was three. And this can be positive or negative. Think like leading or lagging data. And zero returns x as it was given to the function. Um, I've added the ability to preserve spaces. Traditionally, spaces would get dropped in this sort of thing. But sometimes it's nice to keep them. if you want them, so why not? I have a dictionary that you can use. Uh, this defaults to null, in which case I will build one just from the characters in the text you gave me. And then I also have presets from that I just was like, these are probably good presets. And delete is excluded as, as a character because trying to shift by things that don't exist is kind of difficult. And then this bullet point is supposed to be tabbed over, the very last one. And the options are to only use provided characters, which would be when dictionary is null. You can use alphanumeric, keyboard, letters, which would be all uppercase and lowercase, or you can use lowercase or uppercase. And characters are currently only in US English. So for keyboard, I looked at my keyboard and said, these are the characters that belong to keyboard. But if you dig around in the code a bit, you can, uh, I guess we'll see. I can show you which characters are in which dictionary. But here are some examples. So if you had A, B, C, D, E, and you shifted by one, your A now becomes a B, your B becomes a C, and so on. And then in order to go back, I just shift by negative one. I can shift my output from here by negative one. And then a few more examples where here I'm preserving spaces and saying Cypher is a great R package. And then 
um, the dictionary for all of these is being built with the characters provided, and that's why the exclamation point is still included. And then shift it by negative five, we get this mess. We shift it back by positive five, and we have English again. And then here I'm um, not preserving spaces, but the spaces are still counted as a character. Again, because I'm not using one of the preset dictionaries. And so that's why we still have spaces. And then we go back and by negative two, and we're back to plain English. So this is the source. Um, it's questions so far, because everything makes sense to me, but I wrote it, so that's kind of unfair. Okay, cool. Yeah, makes sense so far. <laughs> cool. Um, these are, again, all of the parameters and then the defaults. Um, I have a bunch of code for catching errors that I think I'm not necessarily going to go through as precisely, but if you want to quickly read the error messages, we're just making sure that people are providing actual data and that the number they want to shift by is an actual number. Um, and then also just checking the dictionary and the presets. And then if X is not a character vector, I'm not quite sure why you would want to run a Caesar cipher on numbers, but I won't stop you. So we'll transform it into a character vector. And then we're splitting everything into a list of character vectors where each element in the vector is a single character. Um, it, sometimes it bothers me that R doesn't like the word string, but it's a, everything is a single character. And then here I'm just checking if you want to use a dictionary, I will give you the correct one. I'm using the raw ASCII values and then transforming them to characters so that I don't have to type out long strings of just text. Um, and then if you have a typo, I'll try and do my best to catch that. Um, and then also just double checking. If you do provide your own dictionary, we need to make sure that all of the values in the text are also in the dictionary. Otherwise I can't shift, I'll have some problems. And then finally the actual shifting happens and I didn't show it in the examples, but you can provide a character vector of length greater than one. And so I need to make sure I'm applying over that and then checking and making sure so that I can preserve any spaces. And then I'm shifting each character individually, which is not ideal, but it happens. And a lot of these individual character shifts are using applies because some of the functions like which or if statements aren't natively vectorized. And so it'd be a little bit trickier to swap it out to a fully vectorized format. But um, here you can see, I'm just checking which letter, I'm getting the position of the letter in the dictionary, adding however many places you want to shift, dividing by the length of the dictionary and getting the remainder. And then if it's zero, then I'm just getting the last character in the dictionary and returning that. Collapse it all back into a single um, piece of text rather than individual characters. And then finally, I'm unlisting everything so that you get back a character vector like you turned in. And then I'm returning it. So that's, that's that. And then nothing too crazy. The next one up is an app bash cipher. It's pretty much Wait, the on. same. Hold on a sec. Yeah. <laughs> you want some? Uh... Yeah, just uh, to test. Do you need to specify no, a bit? Um, just scroll up a bit. Uh, yeah. Where you specify the um, uh, yeah that X is uh, if it's not a character uh, you set it as a character is that right yeah the very the very first uh, okay yeah 
there. Oops, sorry you, guys, I you need? need to fix something. <laughs> there we go, now I can hear you, sorry. Okay. You're, you're a little bit quiet, Federica, just in general, just FYI, but we can hear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so here, will you specify if uh, uh, it's not a character? Yes. Yeah, do, do you need to do that? Is that uh, if, what if you don't do this? If I don't set it as a character, then because I'm essentially doing character lookups for the dictionary. So here where I'm assigning the dictionary, this Rada character is taking pure ASCII codes and returning like letters. And so if I tried to look up the position in the dictionary of a number, it wouldn't, I guess it might be coerced to a character, but I don't think it would be. And so this also just makes sure that I get, like, I don't know why someone would give me factors, <laughs> but if someone gave me a factor, then I would get the value I needed rather than a number. Yes. So on all, like this whole block of the um, uh, error checking and all that, it's yeah. funny because this was something I'm looking into right now and I have um, uh, some feedback from Headley <laughs> on what they've been using for um, like input validation. And so mm -hmm. uh, there is, uh, or there's about to be a file within Arlang that use this is going to have a function to just import that file into your package. Instead of importing Arlang, you can just copy that file over to your package. Um, in order to have these error checking kind of things like just built into your package right away, um, which is cool. And so it keeps it base, but uses Arlang. It's a crazy new idea that they're doing. Yeah. Um, and uh, so they have some some clean ways of doing some of this stuff um, where you uh, like coerce if you can get errors if you can't. And so it'll it does like this whole first block, including the coercion to character on 19. Um, you could do pretty easily. Um, but, so that's feedback on that. And then the other thing, you've got the the, the dict argument and the preset argument that kind of fight. Yes. Um, have you thought about maybe making the presets exported functions that you could provide as dictionaries or even exported data that you can provide as dictionaries? That would make too much sense. <laughs> <laughs> and that way you could also, by the way, then you could have, if you made them functions, you could have slight variants of them that are still the same general preset. I can't remember what the presets are, but there might be cases where that makes sense. They're um, uh, these guys. So, you know, yeah. So there, for example, you could have keyboard uh, and put in a few different keyboards, mm -hmm. for example, in the function, things like that. Um, so yeah, that, that was something I saw uh, when you had the, whenever you have two arguments that are like, one of these needs to be set, watch that, you know, because <laughs> that's an yeah. easy way for things to get confusing and broken. Uh, yeah, it wasn't my favorite <laughs> idea, but I wasn't like, it's like, how do I, what's the best <laughs> method for me to do this? And then I think just from the way I built it, where it's like, I need this to solve a puzzle. So I used oh, dict at yeah. first, and then I was like, oh, if other people want to use it, they might want to preset, and then just sort of like <laughs> built it. And then the um, all of the error catching was basically built backwards from me writing tests and then going, hey, this test should have failed. And then yep. catch it. So. But yeah, there's a, um, I mean, there are a few ways to do it that I'm looking at right now, but the general idea is you would say, okay, I want something that can be character without losing anything. And so 
then you you have a function that checks for that. So integers can become characters and you don't lose any information about the integers. And so that it would allow that. But like, um, you know, doubles, you actually doubles probably could do. Um, and it depends on their precision and all that. Yeah. Um, but like, uh, you know, a function couldn't become a character without losing information. Um, and so that's the, the general philosophy of those functions. Um, and then they give nice pretty errors of, you know, this is a character, you know, uh, especially when something that's supposed to be um, an integer and you're saying, I need, I need it to act as an integer. If they, you know, no one types the L's to actually make things an integer. So they're mm -hmm. not gonna send you zero L or at one L for the number of spaces. But if they send you 1.1, that would throw an error saying, you know, explaining, no, this can't be published to an integer because of blah, blah, blah. So um, that's the kind of stuff that's really, I'm hoping that they, that the tidyverse team solves it and makes it standard because it's like, it should be easy. I wish it were just built into R um, to, to easily, you know, it, it, the whole thing is actually giving the error message um, and telling people that, you know, in this function, n should be an integer and use, and maybe it's supposed to be an integer vector and all of them could be an, of, uh, an integer except the 78th value couldn't coerce to an integer. And so it gives you something to look at. Um, so, all right, that's all. <laughs> You're good. So, um, yeah, this is the little like, it won't let me go sideways. There we go. Okay, so at bash is pretty much the same as a Caesar cipher, but it shifts half the alphabet. So you just have A becomes Z, B becomes Y. If you had Z, it turns into an A and so on. Um, and because of this, you can't really use numbers or non-letter characters like you can in a Caesar cipher or that I'm allowing you to do in Caesar ciphers. But here's some examples again. Like I said, A, B, C, D, E would become C, Y, X, W, V. And then you have these uh, transformations as well. I've chosen to keep punctuation um, and capitalization, just as sort of a design choice. I suppose I could allow users to ask one way or the other, or to, yeah, if I provided a parameter for it. But this function is much, much shorter than the others. It just takes an input vector x. I have, again, some basic error checking, and then I'm splitting it out into a list of single characters. And then iterating over that, and I don't need nearly as much as I would with Caesar, although I suppose I could also just pass the current vector to Caesar and say, here, shift this 13 places. But instead, I have just said, if it's an uppercase letter, then use letters, which is the built-in data set with all the uppercase letters. Otherwise, use letters with the lowercase built-in. And then this will give you the place that is you need to swap with. And then collapsing it all back down into uh, strings, and then returning it back to the user. So nothing, nothing. That great. was the other thing. Um, is there a reason you don't use vapply, and then just cast it into a character vector instead of a list? I usually use what I know. <laughs> but that's what that I know doesn't fine. work. So that uh, totally makes sense. But yeah, I think, and then generally it's risky to use S apply, except you're checking everything. So it's probably okay. But yeah. V apply is the one. Well, in this case, you want V apply for probably both of those, ideally. Like if you were trying to make, trying to make this as, concise as possible or whatever yeah the apply is very confusing it's why per exists basically i think so 
it's understandable to avoid it, but it's a good one to learn. And, and just the general idea is that you just tell it what you want the output to be. So it's kind of like uh, map underscore logical or map underscore and enter yeah. all those from per um, that you tell it uh, what you're expecting and then it checks that and then gives you that if it can. Um, that would make sense. And so I, for both the L apply and the V apply, probably in a lot of these functions, yeah. uh, for the L apply, apply and the S apply, I mean, both of those could be V apply with just, uh, I expect character as the result. And in fact, I think you can tell it the, the shape, not just the class. So um, that you expect one value. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't, I don't, I use per all the time, so I can't remember, but <laughs> I always have to look stuff up when I want to write it in base. But anyway, so that would be how uh, I would recommend, recommend doing that. I'm like a cranky old man. I will use base <laughs> unless I, like, unless there's like a solid reason for me to use something else where like I can't do it or whatever. But um, rail fence ciphers, I think you all are going to have a lot of fun with because my implementation is a mess. So <laughs> these are pretty neat where you essentially map a character or a string to like a wave. So if you took, can you read me and mapped it out, you would have this sort of like wave. Um, and these, I'm very sorry for those of you who have trouble seeing my screen, but this is an empty space. Um, I tried to make it clear with the dashes. I did my best. And then this gets compiled across like that so that it gets uh, transformed. So like the first, you just take the first row and then you collapse all of the second row and so on all the way down. And so this one has your vector to encode or decode the width of the rail to be used if you just have a width of one, that's a straight line and your text will look the same. But again, I don't, I won't stop you from doing it. I just will also tell you, hey, you're doing something kind of silly. Maybe that's not what you meant. And then this one does have a separate encryption and decryption method. And so I'm assuming that you want to encrypt unless you say decrypt equals true. And then I will decrypt it for you. Uh, some examples, these are a lot harder to understand without actually writing them out and mapping them. But A, B, C, D, E with the width of two, so that means I have two rows, becomes A, C, E, B, D, and then it just sort of devolves from there. But if you, if you were to map out Cypher as a great R package with four rails, then this is what you would get. And then you could go backwards and so this, I guess I did not highlight this the way I meant to, but uh, we're taking the parameters. Oh, no, I did. OK, so we have the first function, which is rail fence. And then it will do any error checking. Um, I will make sure that you're asking logically for decrypt. And then I'm dispatching my encrypt or decrypt internal methods. And so the next one is encrypting and this one is actually not as crazy as it looks um, so i'm splitting everything out into individual characters or i guess a list of individual characters again um, iterating over that list with something john you said can probably be a v apply but it, for now it will return a list and i'm getting the length of all of the characters and then this really awful vector actually just will return a sequence of numbers. So if your rails are your rail width is three, it will go one, two, three, two, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, and it will go up and down for the whole length of the character vector. Um, and then I'm just making a quick little data frame so that I have all of the characters you gave me in one column, all of my numbers in the other column. And then if I sort by the numbers, that will allow me to collapse it all down by row. And so encrypting is actually not too bad. Um, it's just a little confusing. And if I had comments in here, it would really make a lot more sense. But 
I, I recently added comments. By recently, I mean like an hour and a half ago, I added comments to my source so that I could make sure I was explaining everything properly. But the decrypt method is, uh, as they say, a hot mess. <laughs> and there's a little bit of a reason why, which I'll try and explain in a second. But basically the same as everything else, the way it starts, unlisting the characters all out into individual characters. But this time I'm actually going to make the rails visually, but I, don't, I just don't show it to you. And so I'm making a matrix full of NAs with the number of rows that you want. And then the length will be the length of the character because even though I'm using multiple rows, the number of columns, it's still only one character per column. And then I'm checking my direction and my rail, but this essentially will just create a matrix of this size and it will fill in any point that should have a character with an asterisk so that later I can just loop through the whole thing and dump letters where they need to go. And then I'm looping over that matrix and pulling letters from the right spots. So very messy and not at all efficient. But then once my matrix is full of letters and NAs, I can convert it back to a vector and then drop all of my NAs and paste <laughs> it back into a single string. So that's, it's messy, but it works. And there's definitely a cleaner way for this to be done. I just can't figure out the math I would need <laughs> to, because essentially, here, if we go back to this one, if this becomes a matrix, then I have like one, two, so two, three, four, five, six, and I haven't quite figured out the right math to get the numbers going down this way and then back up that way and like flowing over. And until I can figure out the math to get those numbers, then I'm stuck doing it with two sets of nested for loops, which that's not ideal, but it works. So. Um, Sometimes you need for loops. Like yeah. there's the, there's um, cautions against for loops in R because things are vectorized and a lot of times for loops are slower than that. But if you declare them ahead of time, a lot of times under the hood, you are using for loops even in something that appears yeah. to be vect vectorized. Um, what, just the one major comment on this and I have, a list of functions for you to start uh, <laughs> using. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. The, the sequence functions, I just never quite like internalized as things to, to do. Like I whenever, know they're there, I just never quite like, haven't, I haven't made an instinct to go find them. So yeah, when you have one, two, something, that's sequence length. Yeah. And the reason for, like, actually, I think you might have cases where you want the weird case, but yeah, if if like the length of s is zero, one to zero would return one zero, instead yeah. of you know, instead of a instead of nothing, like so it would actually, you know, it does things yeah. that you might not expect, um, and and then if you know if you're doing something that could come out as negative. Then you end up with re reversed lists or of numbers yeah. that you don't necessarily expect. Uh, so that's that. And then stop if not is just exactly that you had. Uh, I think you've had a couple of cases of if this or yeah. if not this, throw an error, and yep. that's exactly what stop if not is for. Yeah. Um, so if not decrypt or not that, but um, yeah, like if, if not, not is logical. Logical. Yeah. Yeah. So sure. stop, stop if not is logical decrypt would be the equivalent of that. Yeah. Um, I think that was all my thoughts on this. This, you know, I'd need a lot more. I need to sit with this to really understand. Yeah. It this, and figure out if there's an easier way. This one took me the longest 
<laughs> right. Just trying to wrap my brain around. Like, I think I had it encrypting fairly easily and then just going through and decrypting was like, so, <laughs> it's just so confusing because you start like, encrypting makes sense. You're like, okay, I, I just go up and down and up and down and then decrypting you're like, okay, I need to pretend that there's other letters going down and up so I can figure out which column my next letter goes in. Or you go, okay, now I need to count out and figure out which my next letter is going down and to the right. It just sort of... Yeah. I, I like my gut says that you could make a matrix um, that's the right dimensions and then fill it in yeah, and then collapse it um, in both directions, something like that. So, I mean, encrypting, that's, I don't even need to make the matrix because I can just say, this is where, it, this is the row it would go on. Okay. And because it's still like linear left to right, then if I sort by which row it's on, it, yeah. will, it will go in the right spot. But then- I mean, going, I think the data frame is doing the equivalent of, of that yeah. basically, so, but yeah. And then this one just sort of, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I sat this morning for a little bit and tried to figure <laughs> out the math and it, it works out. Actually, let me. Oh. One, two, three, three. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to bump that. Right. Can you all see our studio? <laughs> yes. <Right>. So <laughs> the problem here is it will go up by like four going down into the right. But when it goes up into the right, it goes up by two. And then it goes up by, the index goes up by four and then the index goes up by two. Hmm. And so trying to figure out that math. And then if, let's say I were to do four rows, now it's going up by five in one direction and then it's going up by three in the other. That's, I mean, there has to be an equation there. Yeah, there, there has um, to be. I just can't figure out. Yeah. So this, one way that I have been playing with these kinds of things is chat GB, GPT can be pretty good at figuring this out for you. Yeah. Or not figuring it out, finding how someone else has solved it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the kind of thing that can be useful there. Now, it, I would say about probably 80% of the code it writes is wrong <laughs> or like has made up functions in it and things like that, but it can get you on the right path. So that might be something to try it. But just looking at that there, like, man, there, that. There has to be a That way. is, yeah. Uh, again, I'd have to sit down and play, but there's, that just really feels like it's, uh, it's like n factorial divided by you know something something like that yeah. like one of these uh, equations that actually the, um, the folks reading probability for data science probably would be able to help. I was reading that book and I had to drop out of the club because I didn't have time for it. But um, I'll get there. Yeah, one day it's the, it's got to be there. But, I mean, um, is it just it's not just um, length plus one, length minus one, is it? Or so, because that's up by four and that's down by two. That's up by five and that's down, or and then by three. I think it is. is I guess. So, but you have to know. Make sure, I pick the right spots for. Yeah. Yeah. But I can. Anyway. I can work it out eventually. <laughs> um, this one. I haven't gotten a clear pronunciation, but it's <laughs> French, I think, so I'm not going to try. 
but you can encrypt and decrypt and at its core, it essentially just makes a giant square of Caesar shifts where each column is shifted by a different amount. So one through 26. And then each letter and corresponding key value determine the grid location to choose the obfuscated letter from, which is so confusing, but we can try and make it a little bit less confusing. So you start with a character vector and a key, which is actually another character vector. Um, and it's presumably like a word or a piece of text or something. Um, this one is sensitive to encryption and decryption. And then I'm also asking if you would like to keep punctuation or not, because normally it would not be included. Again, the examples don't really do much to help visualize what's going on, but um, here you can see it. You provide like a key. In this case, I just said key. And so that means that C in cipher is mapped to the K and then E and then Y, and then this H is mapped back to the K again. And then fun function arguments, more error checking, which Ideally, if that rlang thing ever comes to fruition, I can use that. Otherwise, I think I might start using internal functions in their own file, so I'm not rewriting error checking. It seems a little redundant. Um, here, you can see I'm generating the square of all of the di different Caesar ciphers, so I'm just calling on my own shifting all of the letters and then using X to represent how many places to shift by. And I have to suppress messages because the very first column doesn't get shifted at all. And right now Caesar will yell at you and go, hey, you, you can do this, but why are you trying to do no operations on this text? <laughs> uh, transform everything to lowercase just to make it easy for myself and then dispatch or transform the key, sorry, to lowercase and then dispatch the encryption and decryption methods. I have two helper functions, which I'm going to jump over to. Oh, oh no, sorry, guys. Okay, there you go. I have comments on it in my other window just so I can keep everything straight in my head. Um, <laughs> And then, so get letter is pretty simple. It will just return the position of a letter in the alphabet. It, it works. And then if you give me a symbol or something that is not in the alphabet, I'll return zero. Uh, and then the next one is uh, it will repeat the key. I was trying to find an easy way to do this with vectorization but I made it harder for myself by allowing you to preserve punctuation. <laughs> so I, there's like a nice one line vectorized function that will do this so long as everything is a letter. But if you don't have a letter, then I, I need to interrupt the key, pass it nothing, and then pick the key back up when I'm back on a letter. And so it makes it a little bit more confusing. Um, but that's, that is what this does. So again, not ideal, but it works. So that's good for me, I guess. But um, again, if you give me multiple, uh, a vector of length greater than one, I'll do my best to do each of them. Um, I'm asked, just checking if you want to keep punctuation or not. And then this allows me to keep track of what's uppercase and what's not. Um, I guess, sorry, not uppercase, lowercase, but what's letters and what's not. And then I'm splitting the key out to um, here, splitting it so that I can repeat so I get a matching length. And then R and C, I'm using get letter to get the 
um, the row and column combination for the key for the row and then the column is pulling from the input vector. And then um, here I could have used an M apply. I think I used an S apply instead because I had, <laughs> yeah, I guess there's nothing stopping me from switching to an M apply with three things. But uh, for now it is an S apply for a sequence of, a, of length X. And then I'm pulling, if it's a column, if the column is zero, do this. Otherwise, get the position inside the square. And then if you have, if you want to keep punctuation and the original value is uppercase, swap it back to an uppercase letter, return it, and then collapse it back down into a string again. And then this one is a rare rare bird where decryption actually kind of makes a little bit more sense, <laughs> where a lot of it's the same, checking for punctuation, throwing things into lowercase, repeating the key. But this time, I don't need a column. I just need the row value for the key. Because once I have the row, then I'll match. I'm grabbing the column from one of the values in that row. And so here, I do use an M apply. And I'm saying, let's take this column in the first column in the square, which is just A to Z with no shifts. I'm getting the matching row. And then from there, I can grab, that gives me the column, essentially. So if it's uppercase, throw it back to an uppercase. If you want punctuation and there is no matching character in the alphabet, then I will give you back whatever the original character was. And then again, pasting and collapsing back down to a single string. So this one is, it makes a lot more sense when you sit there with the grid and then you go, okay, well, if I have, I guess on this grid, it would be if I have a key value of G and I also have a letter G, which is the seventh letter in the alphabet, then my new value will be an H. And so you can do, do that one, um, but nothing crazy. I don't know if people have thoughts on this one, but cool. Nope, the same thoughts basically. And I let's go <laughs> ahead and skip over the next one so that you can actually get some feedback. Yeah, so, um, yeah. <laughs> let me just see. Yeah, this one is basically the same anyways as the okay. previous one. But instead of using one key and repeating yep. it, you use a key of the same length as the original text. And so this is the one where like in TV shows, you see the detectives are like, we have to find their favorite book and make yes. sure we open it to just the right page. That's a running key cipher. But um, I, guess I did have my note about looking at the description and finding a better way to phrase this. So I don't know. Right. right. It says this can be used to create and solve a running key cipher. Um, this cipher uses a table of alphabetic Caesar shifts for 1 to 26. The key is made to have an equal length to the text by adding the first letters of the text to the key. Each letter and corresponding key value determine the grid location to choose the obfuscated letter from. So. Doing my best, but it doesn't really <laughs> make sense. I don't have a better way to say it. Um, but that'd be a good one to make an issue in your repo that yeah. is tagged with like um, need help uh, so that hopefully someone will come and like give you a hand. <laughs> so right. do your worst or best. Uh, constructive criticism is always good. But if you're like, your this is bad because of X, Y, Z, that's also <laughs> helpful. So. Uh, looking especially for error handling, which I think we covered with Arlang is hopefully going to have cool things. 
I didn't. Yeah, there's uh, there's a pull request that you can look at in okay. use this that implements this thing. So I'll, I'll I'll share that in the channel when we're done. If you if if the input is validated, it shouldn't be possible for any of these to fail, right? Like once the input is what you think it should be, there's no, there's nothing else that would kill it, you know, cause it like, it's not like you're hitting an API. It's, you know, there yeah. are, there's no external forces that should be possible <laughs> with these. Um, yes. No division by zero, none, you know, so. Yeah. And I, um, I didn't show off any of the tests. They are there. Um, I guess this won't let me show, but I have no. tests for all of them down there. Just, I didn't want to get too focused on testing when we go. And if we have time, testing. <laughs> but um, I guess, what is the best way to communicate that? Besides just saying, oh, this needs to be a vector of length one, or this can be a vector of any length, what's the best way to communicate that you can give me different amounts of input? <laughs> ah, that's that's the big question that people are trying to find something standardized on. But, um, yeah. you know, in other languages, you'd refer to things as being scalar or not. Yeah. Um, I, I think what I usually see is in the parameter description, it's it'll say either a character vector, blah, 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 or mm -hmm. a length one character vector or a length one integer. Yeah. Um, so just calling out, or, or sometimes I'll say like a single integer that tells me blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. Other than that, there's not a, I don't think there is a standard. Um, my usual is kind of look at some tidyverse packages and see what they're doing these days, uh, but they're not always perfect either. I think so. I've been sticking with a character vector of length one. Yeah. It's a little, it's a little wordy and clunky. Yeah. I um, think a, a length one character vector works. Yeah. So with the hyphen, so. Um, the code I showed off today did not have comments. Um, yeah. If I show you what I worked on this morning, there are a lot more comments, but what, so let's take a look at rail fence because it does have yes, this one. So like what kinds of comments are ideal so that someone else can jump in and contribute? I think it's, like the R style guide says that comments should tell you why something happens and not what it does. And that's sort of a balance I struggle to find. <laughs> so I think that one at row 36 is not really needed because yeah. like L apply tells us that that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And that's what they mean by that versus that next comment, do the shifting for each character. Um, is that it's more descriptive of what's happening. Yeah. One thing I like the main, the best comments are um, when you do something a certain way because you tried the other ways and they don't work, logging that, especially, you know, the first person, the most important person that the comments are for is future you. Yes. Um, and if you, thought if your first thought was oh an easy way to do this would be this mm -hmm. and you try to do that and then you're like oh no because in this case that doesn't work or whatever yeah. logging that information is super important because later your future you will look at it and go why did i use this complicated code it'd be so much easier to do this other thing and then you repeat yourself of you know doing the failed thing so those i definitely try to log in comments and then a little bit like you've got on at least some of these of what does this block of code do? Yeah. Um, not, you know, not it like it's, it's easy to fall into 
if it's this, do this thing. And if it's that, do that thing. It's like, yeah, that's like, you can just read the if it says that, like okay. the comment is not adding any information. Um, so yeah, that, that one's summarizing this big block of code. And so yeah. I think that's fine. Right. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. It's just sort of like a, I mean, I know in school they are always like, comment on your code and all the students are like, no. <laughs> so, try trying to find the right balance. And then I don't know if you guys any spotted any easy spots for true vectorization rather than apply statements, but I to the point about your comments should say what you tried or why you're doing <laughs> something because the first thing failed, that I think was a lot of my <laughs> applies. So um I guess the other, uh, more back on the comment thing, one way that I sometimes end up commenting code is by turning some big block of thing that needs a comment into a function that has a name that says what it does. And so, the, yeah. you know, that thing that is build a matrix and put in stars, you might want to say, like, make an internal build dummy matrix or something. Um, and then that kind of, explains that and you, if you care exactly how it's implemented you can go look at that function but otherwise you just kind of trust okay it's doing that thing that it says it's doing um i was always more of a split it out into a function if i'm going to do it more than once rather that's than, like if i have unless i guess if i have like some very like specific massive chunk of code then which I guess the the stars this might might fall into, but it didn't really meet my like large enough requirement. So, a rule that I have not stuck to, but that um, I think I still agree with, is you should be able to read a function on one screen, and so you shouldn't have to scroll to see the function. And so you have to scroll to see this function. Therefore, you should split those out. And so. Like you know, perfect rule for this that each of these functions should fit in a box, and if they don't fit in a box, then you probably yep. need to pull pieces of them off into a function, um, because that it keeps you from getting lost. Yeah. Is the general idea, and so that that block where you're saying create a matrix and fill it with a star where a character will be placed that is a perfect candidate for make a function, even if you only use it once, just for readability. Um, and probably, probably the next block too. I can't remember how long it is, but I think, oh, no, nah, that one's fine. It's, it's really just like the, <laughs> because it's the nested if else statements and yeah. Yeah. Like I was very tempted to just go with the, let's just make my one line ifs and then I can add a semicolon. Yeah. I think no, many, no, no, no. <laughs> people would be like why are you using semicolons this is our we we don't do that <laughs> and yeah that doesn't really solve it it's because the idea is it's yeah. cognitive load that your brain can't keep all of this in it and so you lose track of where you are and so yeah. make it a function and then you don't get lost and i um, i do think that putting sometimes doing like uh, i think i have I have them somewhere, one or two of them, but putting like the if statements all on one line. So if I were to do like else if, and then put that on one line and do it like that, that sometimes that makes it a lot more digestible than yeah. leaving it all um, like tested out, but it doesn't work too well if you have multiple layers, so. Cool. That's, that's <laughs> back up. And then I did have one <laughs> like final explicit question, which was, I guess that we, is, we have now yeah. beaten this question to death, I think. That yeah, there's a whole thread. Uh, I have a thread on Mastodon and a thread on Twitter okay. about that very question right now. Um, and it is something that the Tidyverse team is kind of starting to settle out 
mm -hmm. um, how to do it. And it's funny because Hadley said, you know, oh, we use this thing from use this to import this um, file from our lang. And I was like, wait, what? That function doesn't exist and use this. He's like, oh, right. That's a, that's an import request. It's not actually in the package yet. So, but it's, it's still in a pull request, but he has gotten so used to using it that he forgot that it isn't merged yet. So That's, it seems like it quickly became useful. I think it will probably be merged soon. <laughs> yeah. It's a little. Uh, um, they're working on, well, probably because now they have uh, a new team member who can take some of the load off of uh, Jenny Bryan. Mm -hmm and allow her to actually merge these things. So yeah, um, exciting stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say like, they are making it a file that you import. I, I'd be tempted, like I had a package that did it mm -hmm. did all the, that kind of check. I guess the reason to do it as a file is you can delete out the pieces that you don't use in this particular package. Yeah. Um, and you, so you can make one master uh, or one, you know, one large file that has all the types of validation that you might do. And then you get rid of the validation that you don't use. Um, it also helps for people like me who are like, I don't want any, no imports. Yes. No, no dependencies. It's, it was a little painful to not even use the base pipe just <laughs> for some of them. Like there's the one where I'm building the square and I have like S apply, whatever, suppress messages. And I'm like, I, I would love to pipe yeah. this, but <laughs> I, I don't want to leave out my, my homies stuck in 3.6. Yeah. I, I was doing an online homework for school a few weeks ago and the like online R environment was on 3.5. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh no. Watch your, your strings as factors. Yeah. It's, there's oh. a lot of things that it's just, I guess it always is that way in school where they teach a very old style of <laughs> whatever. And, it shows. But. Well, that's very cool. Uh, you should sign up on the schedule for wherever we have space towards the bottom, or I don't know, as soon as there's space to, to show off the package that you're writing for creating yeah. the slide decks. Um, Cause I think that's a neat idea. And if, I, I love that you just made it. <laughs> so I just, I don't know what came over me, but I was like, I would like, to make this so <laughs> i did but i would also really love some help uh for those of you here let me send the link i have yes. some issues already like github issues and actual issues but um i'm working on it it is constantly updating and the goal of this one is that you will take this function, point it at an existing R package, and it will generate the slideshow I just showed you for you. So I spent hours doing this by hand. <laughs> you will now have the luxury of downloading this function saying create presentation, and it will make a nice little presentation in Quarto. And then if you want to, you can go edit the Quarto markdown file yourself. But I, I think that one is super cool. Like I could see people using that for, well, for this club for sure. Yeah. Um, but you know, there are a lot of presentations that if you could get this format down, um, I could imagine building, uh, uh, like some comment parsing in where you could put in comments that are tagged a certain way and it grabs them for the presentation. Like I want to ask the audience or I want to tell you know, point this out to the audience kinds of things. So I think there's a lot of cool stuff that could happen there. There, and there really, is an issue, like uh, related to that for code highlighting. Okay. That's how I had the right the different sections highlighted that it would you would have some way to signal that you want these lines highlighted first and then these lines highlighted second. And I I'm not really sure what 
Um, I guess I'm imagining that if I were to get, if I were a different person, then there would be some direction from on high about this is the way that the deposit powers that be I'll, imagine this would work. And then I'm sitting here by myself going, I'll do my best, but it is. I, there is an answer. So um, if you type a, uh, if you type something kind of like what I'm gonna put in chat in theory, there we go. Um, I'm gonna get rid of a little bit of it because it's messy, but if you type uh, something like that um, in our studio, that becomes a heading in the outline of that piece of code. Yeah. And so you could use that same rule, and I don't remember how many hyphens it needs before it decides that it's a heading, but I you can see, oh, there. Three or four. Four. Yeah. And so you could just have, I, I, I used the word highlight, but I, you know, use whatever you want mm -hmm. that you could um, use. Whenever you see those sections, treat those as a block to highlight. Yeah. And then it's I, something that people are doing naturally already, or not, they're not necessarily, but they could do it naturally and get it. It's useful to them yeah. within our studio. And it's the same use in the presentation, basically. My, my one thing is like, the way I showed, I had the initial function and then I had a few internals that I wanted to show off first and finding a way to, you know, to jump allow down you and then to back not up. step through linearly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, even if you just said like, well, so you could sign uh, and then you were like, whatever, like number and then you yeah. just were like start and then end or whatever. But, yeah. I think numbers or um, uh, I would say let's look at um, package down where yeah. you can create the blocks in the text. Mm -hmm. So you might have a YAML that goes with yeah. the, the functions that well, describe. I was hoping to display. avoid like if my thought was if, if you can, you're going to have to make a YAML, then you might as well just make the presentation. Fair fair enough. But if you want to order things, you're getting into where yeah. you are doing some work to make the, you know, you're at least specifying some info. I, I, I do, I like the idea a lot of just like doing numbered um, headers. So, so sending in the chat sort of what I was imagining. And then it would just be whatever gets highlighted is what's in between your current number and the next number. So. Oh, yeah. You have like that first line of gibberish and then you would go down to the third line of gibberish and then back up to the second. The, yes, I, I get that. That can make sense for sure. I, I think I like the idea of using the four dashes um, to avoid other confusion and to allow people to put more commenting on the line. Yeah. Um, Let's see. Because then it's, you know, like I said, then it actually has a use in our studio, not just for the package mm -hmm. slides. Um, but then again, you could also accidentally get some highlight breaks that way, so. Um, so I guess the last thing was I had looked at the sign up sheet, but I felt guilty about <laughs> putting myself down twice before Lydia did her first presentation. <laughs> and there were two empty slots before. Gotcha. Well, so, yes. So. Uh, Lydia, if you want to move up to like July or August, but probably yeah july or august might not be best for me i'll be starting a new job in, yeah end of june okay. so cool. i i actually won't be available on the july date so if we end up uh, we can go with with her without me but just fyi on that i can i can do august i yeah i mean i have big dreams and it would be <laughs> cool to submit this to talk about at posit conf so 
if I do later, then it's closer to when the conference is. So I can dream big and say, if I were to present this, I'd have a great opportunity to practice and get last minute feedback. That is a great uh, reason. So, and I, I think it'd make a great presentation, so. It would literally write itself. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's gonna be really, you know, that's really interesting, the idea of the package slides deck that is about package slides that's made in package slides. I, mean, I guess there's a package down site that's made there's, in package down, so. There's actually, you can't do that. Um, there's a, it's my only issue that's marked as a bug is our oxygen will, I'm using parse file. And so if you're trying to use it on itself, it will parse the file and hit parse file and then start a recursive loop. <laughs> and I haven't been able to stop that from happening. Okay. Uh, I, I've, I've tried be... like creating a copy of the file and also using like creating a new environment and seeing if I can parse it in a new environment, but it will just keep parsing itself. So you should be able to um, like mock parse file within that file. And so make parse file not call parse file when you're inside of it. My, I mean, I my current plan was to literally add a recursion counter as a hidden argument to the function and then check if it was greater than one. But that's that's really funny. Yeah. Um, uh, well, anyway, whatever, we'll do that offline. Yeah. Um, so I would say for, for this, for the um, Cypher, make sure if you haven't already, make sure you create some issues uh, for the for things sure. that you still have questions about and yeah. um, we can come help you out with those. Um, and, uh, I think, let's see. I think the um, issues will get added tomorrow. I'm actually going to run out the door. Is okay. And then, yeah, just the last thing is I will, um, you know, the, the link that you gave for package slides mm -hmm. is, uh, effectively the same link for Cypher. Um, but let's yes. make sure that's in the chat history and, uh, great. I will see everyone. Well, I'll just See you next month for the club with, uh, looks like Russ uh, Hyde is gonna be presenting uh, the Dupree package. Um, and I will see everyone around in different book clubs before then. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. <laughs>